an ordinary shift for a police officer. It started out as nothing. It was innocuous. It was a, it was a little crime. It can quickly take an extraordinary turn. A simple traffic stop went to Stratosphere within two minutes. It's been you here, 7 0 miles an hour. He's outside the petrol station fighting with another man. A routine case. You can start off with something and it can turn into something completely different. Taser, taser! I'll cheer from you! Can suddenly spiral into a serious incident. Then it switched. He locked the door. She knew that something was very, very wrong here. Stand by, I think we're going to have a decamp. One got out with a baseball bat. There's a ton of campus in the car. They were literally on the rampage. Sometimes the most minor crimes. I was looking for a stolen quad bike, found a lot more. Can crack major cases. We were now possibly looking at a serial killer. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Like and subscribe. Today on Big Little Crimes, a copper's instinct. That doesn't look right. That's a stolen car. Uncovers a major scam. You want to make sure you're going to get the result. You want to bring that person to justice. An anonymous tip-off. It was rotting flesh that was in that unit. Reveals one of the biggest ever cases of food fraud in the country. The sheer scale was something to behold. But first, some dodgy driving. It's a bit suspicious that they haven't stopped straight away. Leads to a career-defining bust. It was certainly the largest drugs seizure that I'd made. When nighttime falls, criminals use the opportunity to work under the cover of darkness. Weekends are particularly busy for police, and PC Tom Andrews is about to have a Friday night to remember. This was one of the, the best results of my career. This case starts as Tom is about to clock off after an uneventful shift in Nottingham. Just sort of doing routine stops, um, keeping an eye out for anybody that might be causing an issue and things like that. It's midnight, and he's been on shift for nine hours when Tom spots a car that just doesn't look right. The vehicle in question had three young lads in it, and the manner of driving of this car just sort of raised a, a little bit of attention. Through any set of traffic lights, they were generally speeding away from the traffic lights. Um, driving a bit faster than the road would normally allow, uh, so just pushing the speed limit a little bit. Um, just things that draw attention to themselves, really. And we made the decision, just once we got through this next set of traffic lights, to try and pull them over on the left, which is just a bus lane. Unfortunately, they, they chose not to stop. Um, they just continued driving at normal road speeds for a bit, which obviously sets your alarm bells ringing a little bit, that why are they not pulling over straight away? Tom's sirens have been on for over a minute, but the car is refusing to pull over. We again signalled for them to stop, uh, but instead they continued down here uh, and then indicated to turn right. What have the three men got to hide? Once we stopped them here, uh, we've both got out of the car and we've gone over to talk. Uh, I went to talk to the driver and she went to talk to the passenger. Tom still doesn't know why they've taken so long to stop, but he soon gets a hint. As soon as I've started talking to the driver, uh, I could immediately smell a smell of cannabis from within the car. It immediately starts setting alarm bells off. What have they got in the car? Are they just using it? Are they driving potentially under the influence of cannabis? What began as a hunch about some suspicious driving is already escalating. But when Tom starts to search the men, things get even more serious. 
And then when we start speaking to them, they're a little bit anti-police. They, they start getting a bit hostile. Once we've started searching them, we've discovered that each of them has got between three and four hundred pounds in cash on them, um, which is quite a lot of money for a young person to be carrying around. Uh, and then within the car, uh, we found a couple of wraps of uh, MDMA. We then arrested the three occupants of the car. Tom's gut instinct about bad driving has uncovered some potential drug dealers. But is there still more to this than meets the eye? Later, the police find more than they bargained for as the investigation hits a whole new level. We realised that we'd hit the jackpot. In our next case, an anonymous alert of some dodgy chicken has environmental health gagging to catch the scammers in one of the biggest food fraud cases they've ever seen. For 30 years, Lewis Coates has worked in environmental health. He's in charge of ensuring the safety of our food. What we are meant to do is essentially protecting the public from harm. But after starting in the most unassuming of ways, there's one case that put people across the country at risk. My team received some anonymous information in the form of a letter that came through into the council, alleging that there was some unscrupulous activity going on at a unit within an industrial estate in Rotherham, relating to meat products, particularly chicken. Ordinarily, anonymous tip-offs like this wouldn't be investigated as a matter of course. But then, there's a further development. Lewis is contacted by a ministry vet with similar suspicions. He had come across some discrepancies in terms of what he believed was condemned meat disappearing out of the, the system and not being accounted for. It's enough for Lewis to think there could be a small crime here worth looking into. We devised a means of actually doing uh, some surveillance in the area which realistically resulted in an officer standing on a toilet, uh, looking through a small window uh, at one particular unit that had been identified. Three weeks of nightly stakeouts revealed that the unit needs to be investigated, and fast. The officer's reports that came back clearly indicated that there was something going on at this unit. Um, but there was another two units involved as well. There was movements of what looked like food products going from this illicit unit to another unit, which was a authorised meat cutting plant that was just across the way in the, the industrial unit, but also products going around the corner to a pet shop. There was evidence to suggest meat was being moved from this industrial unit to a meat cutting plant and pet shop. But why? Lewis needs to investigate further. This has gone from a low level tip off to a high priority case. That seemed to fit in with the tip offs that we'd had about this unit. We decided that there was sufficient evidence there to go for a warrant. We got a warrant from the courts. The team make their way down to inspect the units. What they discover inside takes the case to a whole new level. The, the enormity of the problem hit us. Uh, not just from what we were seeing, but the actual smell of the place. Uh, one of our officers, um, she had to leave to vomit outside. The, 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 the stench was just on a different level entirely. It was rotting flesh that was in that uh, unit. This is way beyond anything they'd expected. We also saw oh, 
boxes and boxes of bleach and boxes and boxes of salt. The fact that there's bleach and salt on site suggests that that meat is being cleaned to try and get it uh, into a state where it can go for human consumption. Incredibly, they discover more than 10 tons of foul-smelling meat. What most people probably don't realize is that there are, there are foods that are condemned. A good example of that is within the, the meat industry where we have got uh, slaughterhouses that produce uh, meat ready to go into um, food products. A certain amount is condemned because it is a, a risk to human health. What should happen is it should get processed uh, and go into the pet food trade. But this putrid poultry is being sold into our food chain. The potential public health risk is huge. And investigators soon make another grim discovery. At the back of the unit, there was a, a freezer that was just full of boxes of chicken and turkey breasts, uh, all with official stamps on. Official hygiene stamps are required to show that meat is from approved premises. They'd actually got a box full of different stamps. Um, so it was obviously something illicit going on. They were fraudulently stamping up the boxes to try and prove that they were from a, a reputable source. Obviously, a lot of work to do. The next step was then to review what we had in terms of paperwork. Could the documents seized during the raid shed more light on what's really going on? So all the paperwork came in as though it was byproducts, looking as though it was pet food, and the meat was then going out under human food names. There was trade there all the way down to Brighton, all the way over to the East Coast, all the way up into Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire, the Midlands. There was a huge area that just from this one unit, we could see that the meat was being moved out to different companies and different butchers in a large area, and vast quantities of it as well. Lewis now realizes the magnitude of this dodgy meat scam. At that point, from what we had as a, as a local issue, where we're going to do a food hygiene inspection and get them registered, it flipped on its head and became something that eventually developed into a national scale conspiracy to defraud. Later, the scale of the fraud gets worse, and so does the smell. It's, it's hard to describe the odour. It really is a rotting pile of flesh. In our next case, a car-loving copper senses a stolen motor is just one small part of a much more elaborate fraud. For Phil Robinson, choosing what career path to follow should have been a piece of cake. Growing up as a kid, uh, my family had a local bakery business. My initial sort of interest was actually to get into, into that business. But Phil swapped baking bread for a life-cracking crime and has never looked back. I enjoyed absolutely every minute of it. It was a, a really interesting, enjoyable career. You would go into work in the morning and you would absolutely not know what you're going to be presented with. But it's what happened early one very ordinary morning that sticks long in Phil's memory. We'd been having a number of break-ins in the area, so we decided to go out in plain clothes, patrol the area, have a look, see if we could find anything untoward happening. But just as Phil and his sergeant are hoping to stumble across a burglary, their routine patrol is about to take a different turn. We've been walking down the street, and this is when I saw the car. Phil loves his motors. And there's something about this one that's caught his eye. The radiator grill and headlights 
didn't fit in with the, the filler cap on the back of the car. Um, the filler cap was from a much, well, from an earlier model of car. So it, it struck me as a little bit strange. That doesn't look right. It sounds like something and nothing, but Phil has an encyclopedic knowledge of cars. I said, well, have a check underneath where the chassis number is and I'll put money on it that where the chassis number is, there'll be some damage to it. The chassis number is a unique identity code. Every car has one. If it's missing or damaged, the vehicle is definitely dodgy. So he got down on all fours with his torch, had a look under and confirmed what I'd said, which was that the chassis number had been either tampered with or welded over. Phil's hunch is right. The car's unique ID number has been removed. A classic sign that it's been stolen. So he runs a check on the police national database to find its owner. Lo and behold, what we actually get from that is the house which the car was parked outside was also where the, the car was actually registered. They're meant to be on the lookout for burglars. But Phil decides this new crime needs urgently investigating. And that means an early morning wake-up call for the owner. Guy comes to the, the window wondering what we want. The suspect needs to explain how he came to be driving a stolen car. At this point, we've got a stolen car. It's just a minor offence, bread and butter stuff to us. It's a minor crime. We're not, at this point, looking for anything bigger than that. But this minor crime is about to take a major turn. We did have some paperwork for it, which was a receipt for the purchase of it. He bought it approximately two years ago from what he considered to be a, lo a local reputable car dealer. He was completely gobsmacked that he's actually ended up buying what we are now telling him is a stolen car. The owner's story stacks up and he's released. Now the person they really need to speak to is whoever sold it to him. The, the next stage in this line of inquiries is we've now got an address for a car dealer. We've got a receipt which suggested it was what would appear to be a legitimate business. Phil traces the car dealership to a local farm and heads straight there to take a look. We knock on the door and we speak to what is the car dealer's wife. She tells us that her husband has actually been arrested by, as she put it, us lot. Why didn't we know about it? He's, he's been arrested for handling or dealing with two stolen cars. The suspect isn't home and won't be back for some time. He's already serving a two-year prison sentence. But Phil has a hunch that what he's in prison for could be just the tip of the iceberg. Phil starts the search for evidence. Initially, it was just looking like a normal farm, but we found he had an office within the farm grounds where he ran his business from. We discovered in his office that there was a large quantity of paperwork. Police seize the mountain of documents and the hunt for evidence begins. Soon, there's a breakthrough. Police discover a finance agreement for the stolen car. And that's just the beginning. What we actually start finding um, are invoices for new body shells for cars. We also find some invoices for damaged cars. He's buying significantly damaged cars. We pick a couple and we check those on the police computer. And lo and behold, we find that one of the reshelled cars has been stolen as well. The paper trail shows the suspects been buying written off cars, fixing them up before flogging them on using fake details. He's ripping people off selling dodgy cars. Phil's hunch was right. This is a crime on a much bigger scale. Then, an informant comes forward saying there's even more to uncover at the farm. We've landed on the farm with two diggers. What we do actually find are two stolen car body shells and a stolen body shell from a van. The suspects tried to hide the evidence, but thanks to Phil's determination, the case against him just keeps on growing. And there is something else that's puzzling him. We are finding spare keys for cars. 
why has he got spare keys for a vehicle? If you sell a vehicle, you give the person the keys. Why are we finding a number of spare keys for vehicles? These keys could be a sign of yet another fiddle. This is now much more than a dodgy car found at the roadside. What Phil is about to discover will blow the investigation wide open and uncover a sophisticated fraud worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. We've now got this scam that's starting to evolve. We've got a pattern of, of stolen vehicles. How many times has he done this? Later, the size of the dodgy vehicles gets bigger. This one was worth around £60,000. And so does the scale of the fraud. This is a clever scam where he's using lots of different ways to, to get money. We're heading back to Nottingham, where one police officer's suspicion leads to one of the biggest cases of their career. PC Tom Andrews' routine traffic stop has led to the arrest of three potential drug dealers. But when he gets back to the station, he's in for a further surprise. Whilst I was booking the three uh, young lads into custody, I was contacted by my radio by my colleague who'd taken the car back to the police station uh, to let me know that she had found more drugs in the car hidden within a void uh, inside the car. So at this point, we really didn't know uh, what we had. We definitely had enough evidence to be able to realistically charge them with possession with intent to supply drugs. But we could only prove at this point that they were perhaps low-level street dealers. This has gone from a case of suspicious driving to one of suspected drug dealing. But on what scale? They had two mobile phones on them each, um, which is quite a common tactic for drug dealing. One that's their personal phone, and then their burner phone, which they use for drug dealing. There's enough evidence to get the go-ahead to search the suspects' houses. It's turning into a long shift for Tom. So by this point, we've been on duty since 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then you can envisage in your head that you've still got uh, three houses to search. Minor drugs paraphernalia is recovered at two of the suspects' homes. Tom makes his way to the final property. So approaching, we didn't know what we were going to find. Uh, obviously, we had a cursory search of the other rooms, but we mostly focused on, on this young lad's bedroom. On a desk, uh, we've seen a car key uh, with, like, a fob on it. That's sort of raised questions a bit, because obviously we've arrested him in a car. This fob was for a different make of car, um, so it obviously wasn't related to the car they'd been stopped in. So we decided to go and have a look around the streets nearby to see if we could find this car parked up uh, and if the fob would indeed unlock it. It doesn't take long before they find what they're looking for. We walked around this corner, pressing the key fob, that we saw some indicators flash. Why would the suspect park around the corner from his own house. Tom wastes no time in trying to find out. We started in the driver's side, uh, in the front area of the car, and just generally worked our way back until we got to the boot. And it was when we got to the boot that we realised that our luck was in. So it was when we got to the boot we realised that we'd hit the jackpot. Inside the boot were two boxfuls of business cards and policing experience told me that those were drug dealer business cards. Essentially, they give them out to their customers. All they have is a phone number on, and the customers will know that they can ring that phone number, uh, and then they can have their drugs delivered to them. So we realised that we were onto a winner there straight away, that we'd found this what was already additional incriminating evidence. The suspects are in way deeper than he first thought. But that's not all. Tom spots a bag. When we opened a hold all that was in the boot, we realised that our luck was really in. Inside a hold all, we found more MDMA. And we're not talking a small amount, we're talking quite a large block here. And it was at that point that we realised that we really had uncovered uh, their stash of drug supply. It's a huge quantity of Class A drugs. This takes the case to a whole new level. 
Certainly finding the drugs was an absolute moment of elation. I contacted my colleague who I'd been with on the initial stop, just said, we found a lot of drugs. And there was a, a massive feeling of happiness between both of us because our, our sort of intuition, I guess, had been justified um, from, the, from the original decision to search these lads and arrest them. And Tom's long night has been worth it. We'd seen the night shift come on and go home and then the following day shift come in. But it made it all worthwhile because we'd got this fantastic result. We'd taken a large amount of drugs off the street. We'd taken three drug dealers off the street. The drugs are taken back to the station and sent off for analysis. Tom waits to find out just how much the stash is worth. And it came back to us that the value of what we'd found was some 12 and a half thousand pounds. The phones that we seized off them, uh, we sent those off for analysis. When we examined the phones, we could see evidence of drug dealing uh, on the part of these three young people uh, all across the city of Nottingham. Faced with a mountain of evidence, the three men all plead guilty. And Tom isn't about to miss their day in court. Because of the, the success and the sort of personal pride that I'd had in the job, uh, I actually went and attended the sentencing hearing on my day off. They're found guilty of possession with intent to supply Class A drugs. Two of the men received jail terms of 18 months and two years. The third gets two years in a young offenders institute. A stop for suspicious driving has ended with three drug dealers taken off the streets. And one of the most satisfying moments of Tom's career. Nobody's going to ring 999 and report a drug dealer because they're either the drug dealer or the customer. So it's always a different level of satisfaction when you come across a job yourself, uh, and especially with such a good result as this. Back in South Yorkshire, the food fraud investigation is about to take an unbelievable turn. A run-of-the-mill environmental health inspection has snowballed into a national food safety crisis. A small tip-off about a suspicious poultry factory has exposed tons of meat unfit for human consumption. From the documentation and the nature of the meat that we'd found in the site, the green, smelly, vomit-inducing meat, um, we realised that at this very point, we were looking at unfit meat getting into the human food chain. The rancid meat is being sold across the UK. And the suppliers are using fake approval stamps to pass it off as fit to eat. Lewis needs to work out who is behind the illegal operation. One of the, the elements we did draw out was the identity of the individual that was actually in charge of this, this operation at this initial unit. Really, that was the starting point of piecing together the string of events and the chain of people and companies that were involved. The man volunteers himself for interview. He provides Lewis with crucial information to help navigate the mountain of paperwork and get to grips with the supply network. But at this stage, we can still only make sense of the chain where it's going from his unit out into the human food chain. It's still a little bit gray around how it's actually getting in to his unit. We know a vague name of a company, this kennels, got no idea where it is. We've got a vague idea that it's originating in slaughterhouses. The man doesn't have all the details, but points them in the direction of someone who does. The owner of the industrial unit. And this chap is also operating two companies. One as a byproducts company, which is pet food, and then one as a human food company. And that's where we get the switch. And it's simply one guy in his van picking up the meat and switching the names in the documentation. It all amounts 
to a fairly straightforward food fraud. The man is brought in for questioning. The second interview was really the, the interview that took it to a different level because we'd got the evidence now. It was coming from the pet food trade and going through into the human food trade. At that stage, the, the investigation took on a completely different perspective. I was now investigating full time a food fraud. And the clock is already ticking to crack the case. We had to be mindful that any, any food offences, we only had 12 months from, from uh, discovery of the offence to where we could lay charges. So we were working to a very tight timeline. The suspect provides the name of two companies, a pet kennels company and a meat byproducts factory. Lewis now knows where the rotten meat is coming from. He organizes a series of strikes. On the same day, we raided the big players, which was the byproducts company out near Newark, the kennels, and a series of cold stores within Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire, uh, where we knew that the meats had gone to to be stored. Seized papers from the kennels confirm unfit meat is being sent to the byproduct factory. It's crucial evidence. Lewis heads to the factory to see for himself what's going on. We arrived on site. It's, it's hard to describe the odour. The odour was the, the, the only thing on your mind. It was in your clothes, in your hair, in your taste buds, up your nostrils. The visual feast of horror that actually greeted us at that site was just on a different level entirely. A fetid mass of poultry meat at one end, which has been, which is green, it's oozing, it's fly ridden, uh, the stench is just, it's indescribable. It really is a rotting pile of flesh that we've got there. But the scale of the food safety risk is even worse than the smell. There was about 12 of these bays uh, within the shed. Each of those bays contained about 20 tons of poultry meat. The evidence that we found at this byproducts plant was really the the clincher to prove that condemned meat was being diverted into the human food chain. But the documentation as well that we seized from this site demonstrated that it, it, it was condemned meat that was coming from the slaughterhouse. Coming into this factory, it was then being boned, so the breasts and the thighs being taken off, and then that meat was being sent out to the kennels. The owner of the byproducts plant is brought in for questioning, along with the boss of the pet food company. It was very much a case of no comic interviews, for example. Uh, that would be a regular feature, and nobody admitting what was going on. Lewis still has enough information to obtain warrants for a final set of raids on premises in London, Sussex and Lincolnshire. He's now taken down the entire UK supply chain. We felt as though we had nailed it at that stage. From the evidence that we'd got, we thought we'd got a very, very strong case for success in court. We really couldn't understand why people would do this other than the profits in it. We believe that the, for that three-year period that we laid the charges, um, that the gang made around about two and a half million pounds. The trial lasts four months. Finally, five people are found guilty of conspiracy to defraud businesses by selling poultry not fit for human consumption. The ringleaders receive sentences totaling 18 years. For Lewis, what started as a minor tip-off about dodgy chicken became a career-defining case. This case was the biggest 
food fraud case that's ever taken place in this country. And I've never come across anything similar again. There's one final case to wrap up today. A stolen car racket is about to become much more. Officer Phil Robinson's instinct about a nicked vehicle has sparked a huge investigation into a crooked car dealer. What started out initially as one stolen car is now starting to mushroom into something which is much bigger. Phil's instinct is that there's more. And stolen cars might not be the only way he's cashing in. There's a lot of finance agreements in these filing cabinets. And the one thing that did spring to mind, or did stand out in amongst all of this, there was actually quite a lot of finance on horse boxes. Each horse box has been bought with a large loan from a finance company. And there are several different names on the loan agreements. But are they the horse boxes Phil spotted on the farm? There was probably eight to ten horse boxes. We know he's doing something with stolen cars. Should we start opening our field of view up here and looking at, at other things? Phil's gut feeling has been right so far. But with the suspect already behind bars, can his wife shed any light on who owns them? The horse boxes belong to the, the customers that are using the stabling. So we're then looking at the finance agreements and comparing them to the registration numbers of the horse boxes that are being stored there. And everything seems, uh, you know, above board. It could be a legitimate part of an otherwise dodgy business. But with all his years of experience, Phil never takes anything at face value. And it's not long before something else catches his eye. My intention is drawn to this tatty-looking flatbed transit. It's got no number plates on it. Why would the chassis plate be missing? Is this a stolen vehicle? It might look like a scrapped vehicle, but he wants to take a closer look, starting under the bonnet. We check the engine number on the police computers, and the engine number then relates to a stolen vehicle. The odd thing about it is it doesn't relate to a stolen box van, it actually relates to something that's been registered as a horse box. So again, I'm looking at this, no, this is a grey BT box van, it's still got the stickers on it. it. Never in a million years has this ever been a horse box. Phil finds a paper trail of documents that reveal the suspect has cloned the identity details of the box van. He's then copied them onto a genuine horse box parked on the farm. So what we're creating now is a story and an identity and a vehicle that actually doesn't exist. But it does exist on paper. Phil soon comes across a loan agreement for £30,000 used to buy the fake horse box. But it's registered to a woman. Could she be part of an even bigger scam? There's only one way to find out, and that's to bring her in for questioning. transpires that she doesn't actually own a horse. And what she actually explains to us is she was a friend of the car dealer. She was approached by our suspect, and they've explained that they can't get the finance. And would she help out by allowing the finance to be put in her name? She thought she was simply doing her friend a favor. All she had to do was sign the agreement, and he would take care of the monthly payments on the loan. She doesn't think that she's doing anything wrong. But what she doesn't know is the loan is actually being taken out to buy a non-existent horse box, registered in his name. That way, when the finance company release the money, it goes straight into the suspect's pocket. Phil knows the loan is only authorised once they've seen the vehicle. So how did the suspect con the finance company? So what we've, we've found it actually did do, he's used one of the horse boxes that's being stored on the farm. He's changed the identity, albeit superficially. He has used the chassis tag that he's taken off the vehicle that we found. He's had a nice, clean, new set of number plates made up. 
and he's put the plates on that horse box that relate to the BT box van. When the unsuspecting finance valuer comes to look at an expensive horse box, the vehicle identity details all appear to be legit on paper. And the finance company decides whether it's worth, you know, the, the £30,000. And if he's happy with the, the basic checks that he's done, he authorises the finance and our suspect gets his £30,000 paid into the bank account. It's a clever scam. The suspect has his money, but the loan still needs paying off. This is where it gets even savvier. After a few months of the suspect paying the loan off, he contacts his friend to tell her the horse box has been stolen. She's gone to the police and reported her horse box stolen, as she's been asked to do. So once the vehicle's reported stolen, the insurance company kick in and they pay off the finance agreement. With the loan balance settled, the suspect still has his 30 grand from the sale of the horse box that never even existed. It's a very clever crime that only a very keen copper could uncover. And Phil's not finished yet. We find out then that another of these horse boxes was financed by another of his friends. This one was worth around £60,000, and it's exactly the same story. The insurance company pay out the finance agreement, and he's left with his £60,000 for a vehicle that actually doesn't exist. The fraudster's been conning finance and insurance companies, and even his own mates. And Phil estimates he's netted half a million quid in the process. Phil's now ready to put all the evidence to him. But there's still one thing that's bothering him. The mystery keys. We actually identify a couple of cars that have been repaired with a new body shell, and we go and see those vehicles. And we find that he's got a spare key for this car that we're looking at. Incredibly, the suspect always kept a spare key from each dodgy car sale, just in case he wants to pinch it back again. So what he was actually doing was stealing cars back that he'd sold, changing their identity again, sell it to somebody else. So he'd actually done this three times on one car. Very clever when you think about it. But it isn't enough to outsmart Phil. He's built a solid case against the suspect. Time to find out what he has to say. So we've got him produced from prison and we now sit down with him, his solicitor, and all this evidence that we've got from the various scams. He didn't want to engage with us. He didn't want to tell us what he's done. He didn't want to admit to anything. It's frustrating for Phil, but after months of hard work, he's confident he's cracked the case. The man finally admits to theft and fraud. He receives four years on top of his current sentence. This is a clever scam where he's using lots of different ways to, to get money. But we've proven a case. We've proven what he was doing. That was the best result we could have possibly hoped for. What started out as a dodgy petrol cap filler ended with the prolific fraudster finally being caught out. An ordinary shift for a police officer. It started out as nothing. It was innocuous. It was, a, it was a little crime. It can quickly take an extraordinary turn. A simple traffic stop went stratospheric within two minutes. Speed is 70 miles an hour. He's outside the petrol station fighting with another male. A routine case. You can start off with something and it can turn into something completely different. Taser, taser! I'm here from you! Can suddenly spiral into a serious incident. Then it switched. He locked the door. She knew that something was very, very wrong here. Stand by, I think we're going to have a decamp. One got out with a baseball bat. There's a ton of campus in the car. They were literally on the rampage. Sometimes the most minor crimes. I was looking for a stolen quad bike, found a lot more. Can crack major cases. We were now possibly looking at a serial killer. Today on Big Little Crimes, a routine call-out exposes the country's biggest ever lethal weapons hall. 
it was an absolute minefield. A simple motoring offence uncovers a kingpin in an international organised crime group. He was speaking to multiple criminals a week. He was organising between three and five different deals at a time. But first, a standard stop and search unearths a terrifying gang responsible for a string of violent robberies. jobs that stay with you um, for life because of the um, trauma involved. But not all big crimes appear that way at first. For Detective Constable Anthony Calvert, this one case started with a run-of-the-mill call-out in rural Staffordshire, where builders are renovating a pub. The workers spotted a car. Looks suspicious. There were two male youths on board the car and two females. And there was something about the behaviour of the occupants of this car that didn't sit right with these builders. A local police officer on patrol also spots the car. Suspicious they might be up to no good, he parks up to keep an eye on them. The, the way they were interacting together didn't seem natural. There seemed to be a certain degree of tension. The officer decides to investigate. As he gets closer, he smells cannabis. So he immediately searches the young men and their car. One of them had possession of a small amount of cannabis, which today isn't that unusual. But as the officer continues the search, things just get more and more suspicious. There were several mobile phones in their possession. There was something not right about this vehicle. For instance, they couldn't find the keys initially. When asked how they got there, they said they travelled there by train. And that's completely disregarding the vehicle that they'd been associated with just moments before. It's all very odd. And very odd for a police officer rings alarm bells. Quick check of the mobile phone, asking questions around that. One of the youths, the males, said um, he'd found it on a train on the way down. Knowing something isn't adding up, the officer runs the number plate through the system. It's a fake registration, and the car was reported stolen a few days ago in Manchester. The minor crime is quickly developing. An area search of the immediate surroundings revealed that the keys had been thrown. They were found close by. That's another alarm bell. They could only logically have come from one place at this stage. The officer immediately arrests the two young men, and the girls in the car with them are taken back to the station too. The possession of drugs and driving a stolen car are both pretty common offences. So the expectation is that this case can be wrapped up quickly. But news from 30 miles away in Manchester is about to turn this straightforward investigation on its head. At the same time, Anthony is at his desk in the city. His team are looking for a car that's been involved in a brutal robbery. And they discover it's the same car that's just been stopped in Staffordshire. When that alert went live, we found out about the Staffordshire police stop. A young man has been lured into the car before being driven away and violently robbed by three youths. The victim of this traumatic crime had managed to remember the vehicle registration plate. And lo and behold, that was the very same false registration plates that were affixed to this vehicle now in Staffordshire. A small, everyday case is beginning to grow. So the decision was made fairly quickly to transfer the prisoners to our custody here at Central Manchester so we could deal with a wider investigation. A standard stop and search has now escalated to a kidnap and robbery case. CCTV evidence 
could hold the key to this case. In the UK, we have more cameras than any other European country. It means we're all caught on camera dozens of times a day. The Greater Manchester Robbery Unit look at the CCTV across the city. Can they find the evidence they need to match the car and the young men inside it to the brutal robbery? They've got two men in custody. But the victim says there were three youths involved. Then a breakthrough from the girls found in the car with the suspects. It became apparent that they only just met up with the males on board this vehicle. And it also became apparent from that there was a third male who'd actually gone home before the car had arrived in Staffordshire. This could be the third young man involved in the terrifying robbery, but they still need to identify him. The team used CCTV to build up a picture of what happened on the night of the victim's ordeal. They spot him on camera, and he's with three young men he's just met. He's been invited back to a party. Next, he's spotted at the petrol station with the same three men. The premise here was for the victim, look, we've bought the alcohol, you pay for the petrol. And so our victim quite willingly pays for fuel, gets back in, and his journey continues down these side streets. He has no idea now where he is. Then, the night suddenly takes a sinister turn. Suddenly, the victim's isolated. This is the point. The atmosphere inside the vehicle changes. One of the occupants turns to him and says, give us all your stuff or we're going to stab you. The victim is robbed at knife point. The gang steal anything valuable along with his phone. It's not just his property that's being stripped away here, it's his dignity. It's a way of completely disarming this victim. And they won't let him go. The victim is forced to get out of the car and go into a supermarket with one of the gang. The blonde man is making him enter his pin code to pay for their alcohol. They went to a self-service checkout. It was quarter past midnight. As is standard in a self-service till whenever alcohol's passed through, an alert light comes up. This is the point where our victim makes his snap decision. Perhaps realising this is the best chance he'll get, he snatches his mobile phone back from the offender and immediately says, you're not robbing me anymore, then tells the offender, I'm phoning the police, and starts shouting out for security staff to come over and help him. That's enough for our offender. He's quickly on his toes and runs off. I can't imagine how traumatic this was for the victim. Now they've got the vital CCTV evidence, the team interview the two young men in custody. Frustratingly, they stay tight-lipped. And there's no sign of the third man police think is involved. But the team are still talking to the girls who were found in the car in Staffordshire. What they're about to tell officers ramps up this crime to a whole new level. Now, critically, the girls stated that earlier, in the hours of that morning, they had witnessed yet another robbery involving the males on board this vehicle. It's a big development. Just how many violent robberies are they responsible for? Later on in the investigation, the net closes in on the mystery third gang member. In our second case today, 
a common call out to a house leads police to uncover an astonishing stash of deadly weapons. Detective Sergeant Neil Rumsey worked for Suffolk Police for 28 years. A report has just been received about a disturbance at a house in a small, sleepy village. Wyverston is a quiet, picturesque, rural Suffolk setting where crime rates are extremely low. Despite the low crime rates, officers still need to do background checks on the people in the house before they go to investigate the disturbance. The control room operator would normally look at the address and look at who the occupants are and would tell the officers if there are any warning signals. The checks show that a local parish councillor lives there and he holds a firearms licence. Most people who hold firearms licences are avid shooters, maybe involved in controlling vermin or go on shoots. So most people who hold farm certificates are very, very vigilant. The police arrive to find out what's gone on, but they soon discover much more than they bargained for. And when the officer went through the door, it was quite obvious that there were loads of weapons, even in, just in the lounge where I think they went initially. So I thought, this is not quite right. The owner has got a license for 17 firearms, but by law, they should be kept in a secure gun cabinet under lock and key. Instead, they're strewn all over the house, and there are definitely more than 17. The owner, James Arnold, is immediately arrested. He claims he's keeping the weapon safe to stop them from getting into the wrong hands. Neil heads to the house to investigate. There was weapons absolutely everywhere. And, you know, I've, I've never seen anything like it. The investigation has rapidly developed into something much more sinister than the initial report of a disturbance. A specialist team are brought in to scour the house for clues. They search every inch of every room. And what they discover inside a pantry takes the investigation to new heights. This actual pantry had a, a false wall, and when that false wall was removed, it revealed just a small safe at ground level. And when you crawled through the safe, you went into a void which was absolutely stacked with weapons, ammunition, detonation cord. It was an absolute Aladdin's cave of weapons. The scale of the crime just keeps on growing. There was handguns, rifles, shotguns, submachine guns, rocket launchers, grenades, detonation tape, incredible amount of weaponry, explosives. It, it was a minefield, it really was. It's enough firepower and explosives to start a war. Why has Arnold got such a colossal collection of illegal weapons? I suppose my thoughts initially is that the offender here has some sinister motive. Personally, I felt maybe terrorism or maybe something similar along those lines because the accumulation of weapons was so massive that it's hard to really comprehend why someone would have such a massive arsenal of weapons and ammunition. Neil is now in charge of the biggest case of his career, and it calls for high-level support. He contacts the Ministry of Defence and the Counter-Terrorism Command. And I mean, this is something that I'd never come across before, and neither of many of my colleagues. I mean, explosives are very, very rare in, in the police career. You don't find explosive on a very, well, ever. So this was new territory for me and for my bosses. So exciting, but challenging. What started as a report of a disturbance has led to the discovery of weapons on an unprecedented scale. Thankfully, Neil and the team have got them out of the wrong hands. But the investigation 
is far from over. A collection this size could cause devastation on a huge scale. Neil needs to find out where Arnold got the weapons from. Could someone else be involved in this potentially lethal conspiracy? Later in the investigation, the scale of the crime just gets bigger and bigger. We actually found 136 handguns, 177 rifles, 88 shotguns, machine guns, and over 200,000 rounds of ammunition, which just shows you the size of this seizure. Massive, massive seizure. In our next case, a simple motoring offence unearths a drug smuggling operation on an international scale. Sometimes an ordinary day at the office can quickly take an extraordinary turn. This investigation started with a small piece of information concerning who was the registered owner of a heavy goods vehicle and culminated in an international investigation. Martin Clark is the Northeast Branch Commander for the National Crime Agency. We focus on organised crime groups, top tier of, of UK crime. This one case stood out from the moment it landed on Martin's desk. The NCA responded to a, a major human trafficking incident uh, in the south of England. 39 Vietnamese migrants have tragically been found dead in the back of a lorry in Essex. And it's down to Martin's team to track down the owner of the lorry's cab or tractor unit. The tractor unit used in that incident was registered to a Thomas Maher. Thomas Maher was historically involved in running HGV firms. Officers immediately arrest Maher and search his house to see if they can find any evidence to connect him to the horrific incident. But Maher swears blind that he'd sold the tractor cab months earlier and had just forgotten to re-register it. The team examine his mobile phone. Uh, were, we discovered evidence on that mobile phone that actually corroborated his account concerning the sale of the tractor unit. We were able to discount Mr. Maher's involvement in the human trafficking incident. Thomas Maher is released without charge. But Martin isn't satisfied. He's as squeaky clean as he makes out. Investigations show that his haulage company closed years ago. But officers have been to his house and something isn't adding up. He's got a Range Rover and a Corvette, high-value cars. He's got a lot of expensive pieces of artwork, watches, jewellery. He's gone on a number of expensive international holidays, spending over £100,000 in cash, but he has no discernible income. We've done a lot of research around any businesses, where the money can come from, and we just can't identify any legitimate sources. Martin's determined to find out how Maher is living a life of luxury when he doesn't have a job. And he quickly uncovers more worrying information. Once we discovered that Mr. Maher was linked to the, the Essex vehicle and we were able to identify previous events in which vehicles registered to Mr. Maher's companies had been stopped at the ports and found to contain illicit commodities. The lorries had been carrying Class A drugs and large amounts of cash. Maher has been ruled out of any involvement with the tragic deaths of the migrants. But his failure to re-register the vehicle has put him on the police's radar. And the investigation is rapidly turning into something much more complex. The team dig deeper. So we believe that Thomas Maher was uh, conducting meetings with associates away from his home address. So we use surveillance as a tool to be able to follow Mr. Maher. These meetings are conducted in quiet areas of restaurants or they're in the open air. They're conducted where it's difficult 
for anybody to overhear conversations. Maho's behavior is suspicious, but there's no proof he's involved in anything criminal. One of his meetings will soon become very important to the investigation. In this particular image here, we can see Mr. Maha meeting with associate Jason Reed. While the team look further into Reed, they discover from Maha's phone records that he's using an encrypted device called EncroChat to communicate with people across Europe. He could send text messages, send photos to members within an enclosed group on a chat. And the individuals within the groups had anonymity because they only ever went by um, a communications handle or a nickname, if you like, which identified them on the, on the EncroChat network. It's a significant development. Why is Maha having conversations he wants to keep secret? And crucially, what are they about? Months pass while the National Crime Agency work with their European counterparts to access the EncroChat network. There were over 100,000 lines worth of communication data, text messaging, messaging, photos. The next challenge was to decipher it. It's painstaking work as investigators trawl through the messages. After weeks of working day and night, they hit the jackpot. Someone going by the username Satirical is clearly involved in organized crime. The content of the, the Encro chat text messaging was incredibly damning. It detailed multiple conspiracies to supply Class A drugs and to launder the proceeds of crime. Martin's hunch is correct. Something much bigger is at play here than simply failing to re-register a vehicle. He's convinced that Satirical is his prime suspect, Maha, but he needs evidence to prove it. They also sought to further conceal their conversations by talking in a coded language. On here, he talks about following a 15 run. Next week, there'll be 50 or 20 bits. What that means, 15 or 20 bits refers to 15 or 20 kilos. Um, the likelihood is that's 15 or 20 kilos of Class A drugs. This one details the, there's a run on Thursday, landing on Saturday, can do 16 to 20, and at a cost of 2,500. What that means is there's an importation happening this week. The transport is likely to leave Thursday and arrive Saturday. And two and a half thousand refers to what someone was going to gain from the transactions. The messages have exposed a huge Class A drug trafficking operation around Europe. They also reveal the gang's plan to hand over some drugs money in Ireland. They decide to strike. Uh, Jason Reed was arrested in the Republic of Ireland, involved in the exchange of 600,000 euros in cash. The Garda in Dublin were able to observe this exchange going ahead and seize this cash. It was a very important event for us. Jason Reed was the man photographed meeting Maha just weeks before. The pieces of the jigsaw are finally coming together. But can police prove that he's the man behind the secret conversations? One of the important pieces of work that we had to do at this point was to attribute the handset to Mr. Maha. In order to do that, we looked at the photos that were recorded on the handset. Within those photos, there were some images of a bedroom with a, a large plasma screen TV on the wall. When Mr. Maha's house was originally searched several months before, the bedroom was photographed. Within that bedroom was the television that was on the wall. We begin to build that bigger picture that Mr. Maha was indeed the user of that EncroChat telephone and also that he was the, the call handle satirical. It's a breakthrough. It is Maha behind the messages. The team are building a strong case against him and he has got no idea they know any of it. We were able to establish that Mr. Maho was that professional facilitator for the various crime groups. He was speaking to multiple criminals a week. He was organizing between three and five different deals at a time, and it might be moving drugs from Europe into the UK and moving cash out. And he didn't really have to move from his sofa to be able to achieve it. Maho has made a huge £1 million from his criminal activity. 
Martin immediately arrests Thomas Maher. Frustratingly, he answers no comment in the interview. But with such damning evidence against him, he's got no way out. Thomas Maher pleaded guilty to four offences, two offences of conspiracy to supply Class A drugs and two offences of conspiracy to launder the proceeds of crime. And he was sentenced to 14 years and eight months imprisonment. Jason Reed is jailed for seven years for money laundering and possessing the proceeds of crime. In total, the gang identified through the EncroChat device a sentence to a combined 27 years in prison. What started as a failure to re-register a vehicle ended up bringing down a large-scale organized crime gang. This was the first investigation that received a guilty plea based on EncroChat data alone. So it was quite a groundbreaking moment that the evidence obtained from the EncroChat data had prosecuted a really high-ranking individual. Back in Manchester, a routine stop and search has uncovered a gang behind a series of violent crimes. Detective Constable Anthony Calvert and the Greater Manchester Robbery Unit have got two young men in custody. They were stopped in a stolen car and have been linked to kidnapping and robberies. The first victim said he was attacked by three youths, but police can't find the third suspect. They've got a CCTV image of his face, but don't know his name or where he's hiding. It's quite rare that we come into possession of full facial imagery at a close distance in very well lit conditions, in, in full color. And that's what we had. Now that came into play now. We now know that this vehicle was involved in this kidnap attempt where the third offender was present. The team are getting closer and then they make another breakthrough. We looked at this image and research indicated he was the brother of one of the offenders in custody. Anthony immediately arrests the third young man. He now needs to link the three youths to all three crimes, the stolen vehicle and both robberies. Police trawled the CCTV from the area the car was stolen. These are the steps captured in the CCTV footage that we seized. The victim went down these steps and was robbed just out of the coverage of the cameras. The offenders run up once they'd robbed from him his vehicle keys. We could see from that footage the orange flash associated with the car then being unlocked and driven away at speed. It's a major development. But they need a clearer image to properly identify the gang. And the CCTV continues to give them vital evidence. Soon, another breakthrough. Footage from a shop shows a clear image of the three men. And they look all too familiar. Looking at the image of this offender at this supermarket, that bright coat immediately rang a bell and drew us straight to a stop check that had happened right in the middle of this offending story. It was just after the robbery of the car and just before the kidnap offence. The three young men had been stopped earlier in the week by officers from Anthony's team. The image here is still taken from uh, body-worn video footage uh, from the police in plain clothes who stop checked the three suspects you can see here. In terms of evidential worth of this image, can't really overstate how important it was. It was very important. You have the visual continuity of the clothing. You have quite clear facial shots. And it all just ties it together. Anthony and his team can now clearly link the gang to stealing the car and the kidnap and robberies. 
Now they need to prove that they haven't violently robbed just two people, that there are other victims too. Now we turn back then to the phones that have been seized from the male suspects by Staffordshire Constabulary. We were quickly able to establish that they belonged to two other victims. One of the victims was the one the girls had witnessed in the car. The scale of the crime is getting bigger by the minute. They trace the victim who the girls had witnessed using the mobile phone stolen by the gang. He too was lured into the men's car with the promise of a party. He confirms he'd been violently robbed. The girls are already on board. They see this lad come into the back. They don't know who he is or why he's there. And then all of a sudden, they witness the robbery he's subjected to. His properties demanded from him. His bank cards are taken from him in a card holder. His mobile phone is robbed from him, all under threat of violence. And then, in order to get the PIN number for the card, as well as threats being made, the vehicle is sat in, he's driven erratically to scare him. A standard vehicle check has uncovered a web of terrifying robberies. But this time, there's one difference from the other victims. There are witnesses. The victim, understandably, was so shaken, he felt he wouldn't be able to identify the offending parties again. What if the two girls were able to pick out the victim himself, thereby putting him in that car at that time as the victim of that robbery? We secured imagery of the witness, the victim himself, and we put that amongst others who look similar. And sure enough, both girls were able to identify our victim. It's a great result. And not only that, two of the victims and the girls from the car are also able to pick out the criminals in an identity parade. What started with a regular stop and search has exposed a gang behind four horrifying robberies in just six days. They've got a mountain of evidence against the young men, but they plead not guilty in court. They wanted to run a trial, which is their right to do. However, eventually, it was accepted on the full facts, and slowly but surely, each and every defendant in this case pleaded guilty and received a considerable jail term. The gang receive a combined total of 11 years in prison. What these people went through will have changed them for life. Um, if we can in any way help or help resolve those issues by giving just a small amount of closure, by bringing to justice those who have wronged them, then I'm incredibly pleased with what we've achieved. It's time to wrap up our final case, where a report of a disturbance in a rural Suffolk village has blown up into a massive investigation. DS Neil Rumsey and his team have discovered an arsenal of dangerous weapons at the home of a local parish councillor. And now they found a secret room with even more inside. This property was set in several acres of land. It was clear that he had secreted weapons in order that they shouldn't be found. The whole of the land had to be searched. While the mammoth search kicks off, Neil needs to speak to the man in custody, James Arnold. I was involved in the uh, intelligence interview with this person, and the purpose of that intelligence interview was to try and find out from him why he had these weapons and where the weapons were from. Arnold claims he was keeping them from getting into the wrong hands and maintains his innocence. The team have finally finished a forensic search of Arnold's house and grounds. Neil can't believe what they're dealing with. We actually found 136 handguns, 177 rifles, 88 shotguns, machine guns, 
400 detonators, some of which could be activated electronically by mobile phones. We've got over a thousand feet of detonation cord, which is used obviously for explosives. Uh, tank missile launcher, rocket launcher, and over 200,000 rounds of ammunition, which just shows you the size of this seizure. Massive, massive seizure. It's the largest stash of illegal weapons to be uncovered in England. And disposing of them is no easy feat. Some of those explosives there couldn't even be transported away from the premises because of the risk and had to be exploded in the, in the grounds of the property. The villagers are blissfully unaware what danger lies on their doorstep. The public need protection from this, particularly people living in close proximity to the address. But Neil is still no closer to knowing why Arnold had this enormous collection of weapons. He needs to find out where they came from. The name of Anthony Buckland, a registered firearms dealer from Norfolk, uh, had cropped up. A number of guns at Arnold's house are registered to Buckland. So why does Arnold have possession of them? Some of the weapons found at the address in the village in Stowmarket should have been in the custody and control of the firearms dealer, Mr. Anthony Buckland, in Norfolk. But clearly they weren't, and this was a cause for concern. Neil urgently needs to speak to the firearms dealer. I went to the address and the door was answered by a man who identified himself as Mr. Anthony Buckland. He said to me, you're not coming in, and was quite um, vociferous. It's a worrying development. Why won't Buckland let Neil inside? What has he got to hide? I said, well, we will be coming in and we'd like to come in without using force. After a tense few minutes, Neil and the officer are finally let inside. They tell Buckland they need to search the property. Mr Buckland's whole demeanour just suddenly changed and became quite fidgety and nervous and picked up a crowbar, a, a screwdriver, and tried to open a large metal cabinet. I didn't really know at that time why this cabinet was significant, if it was. Buckland knows the game's up and reveals a number of illegal weapons. One such weapon was a walking stick gun. Now, a walking stick gun is, is what's known as a disguised weapon. And it's exactly as it says. It's a walking stick. And in the crook of the walking stick is a trigger mechanism. And at the end of the walking stick is the actual chamber where the bullet is fired from. Buckland is immediately arrested for possession of illegal weapons and other firearms offences. As a registered firearms dealer, Buckland has to keep an official firearms register. But is it up to date? It appeared that the register had actually been redacted and altered. So this really took our investigation on a completely another level because we were now looking at other offenses the number of offences is growing by the minute. Buckland could be handing out lethal weapons to extremely dangerous people. And there's no record of any of it. And it all started with the report of a disturbance in a house. What started out as something very small is beginning to grow and develop. A specialist firearms officer has spotted that Buckland is converting illegal semi-automatic weapons and selling them as legal firearms. Law-abiding citizens around the country could be in possession of illegal weapons without knowing it. To be converting weapons and selling them to unsuspecting customers in this way was quite a sinister act. Buckland has been a well-respected member of society for years, but the facade is quickly crumbling. Buckland claimed to have had a knighthood awarded by the Queen. This wasn't the case. This wasn't true. He claimed to have served in the SAS. 
following in his father's footsteps. This wasn't true either. This, to me, gave us a clear indication of the character we were dealing with, a fantasist, a person who was living a lie, who had sucked in members of the public because they saw him as a fine, upstanding member of the public and had purchased weapons from him. Despite all the evidence, Buckland denies any wrongdoing. But Neil knows he's got everything he needs to charge him. Mr Anthony Buckland was charged with several offences of transferring a prohibited weapon, fraud by misrepresentation, uh, possession of a disguised weapon, that was the walking stick gun, and transfer of a prohibited weapon. James Arnold, who had an arsenal of illegal weapons in Suffolk, is also charged. But before his case goes to court, he dies from a serious illness. The police will never know why he had so many lethal weapons. Anthony Buckland's trial lasts three weeks. He is convicted of fraud and selling prohibited weapons and sentenced to six years in prison. It all began as a report of a disturbance in a small, sleepy village and ended uncovering the largest illegal weapon stash found in England. I've never, ever been involved in an investigation that started with a minor incident and just snowballed into something so huge. And to be quite honest, it will live with me for the rest of my life.